About 18 months ago, my friend and occasional fellow co-host Wolf surprised me with a 3D printed Macintosh case, which is designed to put a Raspberry Pi 02W inside. He didn't have any beige filament, so printed it in black, but I think it looks great. He only printed the back case and the front fascia, which is enough for me to get started. More about this in a minute. Our good friends over at PCBWay have kindly sponsored this video. PCBWay offers a variety of services from PCB production and assembly to 3D printing in various materials, injection moulded plastics and even sheet metal fabrication. They offer a very professional and high quality service for extremely reasonable prices. Check out a link for their website in the description below. You are supposed to screw the front fascia into the rear case, but I don't have the right parts to do this yet. So my plan for the moment is to use some double sided tape, which you'll see me try shortly. Now why is it taking me so long to do something with this case? Well, two problems really, and neither of them are to do with me being a massive procrastinator. Now reason number one is I lost my original Pi 20W, right in the middle of the great Pi drought, which I think must have got mixed up with some rubbish and thrown away. And that leads to the second reason, those pesky scalpers who were listing them on eBay with disgustingly high markups. I decided I wasn't going to play their games and put the case on the shelf. However, hurrahs, as earlier on this year, I received a notification from one of the pie suppliers here in the UK that they were back in stock. So I hurriedly ordered one and it arrived a few days later, so I decided to start up the project again. The next thing I had to order was a 2.8 inch 640x480 display from Waveshare. This slides quite nicely into the front fascia and requires nothing else but friction to hold it into place. Once it's installed it's supposed to look really good and I can't wait to see it in operation as it's supposed to look incredibly sharp. The Pi is mounted at the bottom of the rear case and the display in the front and you'll need a 40 pin extension cable which has a striking resemblance to an IDE cable and you can't get the wrong end as only one will fit into the display. As the Pi 2.0 is so small, there's plenty of space inside the case to smush the 40 pin cable in. The display draws its power from the GPIO header, so there's no need to worry about hooking up a separate power supply for it. To get it to work, you need to add a couple of lines to your config.txt file and put some files in a folder called overlays. I've mentioned before how Linux and I don't get on very well, but happily this can be done via your computer and not involve hacking the mainframe. As stock still seems to be a little low, the only Pi I could get my hands on didn't have the pre-soldered GPIO headers on, so I had to source these separately, and soldering isn't one of my particularly favourite pastimes, but needs must, and I've watched enough videos to get an okay result, but I'm not yet brave enough to show you how I got on, so let's just say that it works, it's not pretty, and I still need further practice. Once the GPIO headers are installed, it's simply a matter of plugging in the extension cable to the Pi and the other end into the display. There are some suggestions on how to fold the cable for better fitment, but I like the Jeremy Clarkson approach of POWER and forcing it all in to close. Jokes aside though, as there's so much room you really don't need to worry. I decided rather than using my Aldi special soldering iron, I'd buy a more upmarket and fancy one from Amazon, which came with some helping hands and a dial to control the temperature. However, even with this fancy setup, it was still quite a challenge to get all 80 pins connected. I don't know how other people manage to film whilst they're working, as you're always at a really annoying angle, so the audience gets a better view. But I'm still very much an amateur, so my arms and hands get in the way, mainly to hide the fact I don't really know what I'm doing, despite what I tell myself. I'm told the first pin can act like an anchor and hold the rest of whatever it is you're trying to solder in, but I wished I'd used some tape. Even with the helping hands, I could have done with a couple of extra hands. And I knew I had some flux somewhere in the shed. And other, much better solderers are always telling me that flux is your friend. The only stuff I could find was plumber's flux. I mean, to me, flux is flux, right? It kind of does all the same thing. Answers on a postcard, please. Or just in the comments below would be fine, actually. The main problem I had was the tip of my iron didn't seem to get as hot as a few millimetres higher meaning I couldn't easily heat up the legs with the end and dab on some solder. It took me quite a while to hone the exact technique, and knowing my luck, I was probably doing something wrong. But if anybody has any ideas on how to prevent this in the future, please let me know. I'd be interested in learning how I can improve. After about an hour's tedium, I mean work, I managed to get all the legs connected. I'd been careful as I was going along not to bridge any of the connections. 
and I found the easiest way to solder was to work along the bottom row of pins first and then flip the board upside down and do the top row which would now be at the bottom. I mentioned earlier that I didn't have the right parts to get the front fascia connected so I ordered some apparently industrial strength double sided tape which of course turned out to be useless. I decided against using super glue or VHB tape as there may be a reason for me to go inside the case at some point in the future. I therefore didn't want to have to destroy the case to gain access to the innards. I don't know if the tape I bought wasn't thick enough or what, but it just wouldn't stick, despite the fitment of both parts being very good. The other thing I hadn't accounted for was how fiddly it was to remove the backing of the tape. I have speeded up the footage 8 times so in total all this faffing around took over 2.5 minutes. Why are some parts of projects so unnecessarily annoying? The Pi took quite a while to boot to the desktop and I'm going to look at a way to boot the emulator directly rather than booting the whole Raspberry Pi OS and then launching it afterwards. But once loaded you simply double click an executable which will launch mini vMac and proceed to boot to a freshly installed macOS 7.5.3 desktop. Now I like mini vMac, it's nice and easy, but I do want to use my preferred emulator, Basil S2. It's highly configurable but requires compiling the thing and that means some scary terminal stuff. Don't be lulled into a false sense of security by the guide on the official Basilisk 2 website. It nearly always does require more than the four lines to paste in and expect it to work. I had issues with dependencies, then I had issues with the compiler not seeing GTK. Yeah, it was not fun. So until I can figure out how to compile Basilisk 2 from source successfully, then Mini VMac will do. What I was thinking of doing was getting some screenshots of my favourite applications and games and having those play on a screensaver. If I want to do anything in classic macOS, then I can boot the emulator and play. I think mainly this will just be a cool desk ornament. It's been a fun little project, and I think the end results look great. Oh yes, and the screen is fantastically sharp, but I may need to buy some reading glasses if I want to use it as its native resolution. Links to the project are in the description below, and as always, thanks for watching.